hi guys, this is Mokami and Chido, and we are starting this discussion on the Africa we want, and what we are trying to do is have conversations uh, that shape Africa policy and things that affect Africa in general, and look at what the future looks like for Africa, and what would the Africa we want look like, and what are some of the things that the Africa we want should look out for to achieve that objective and to achieve what any African person would say this is the African proud to be part of. So I will let Chido introduce herself and then we will jump into the discussion for today. Uh, my name is Chido Chasha Nicolette Nure. I'm currently pursuing a master's in international trade business and investment law at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. But I'm originally a lawyer from Zimbabwe. It's really good to be here. It's really good to be discussing on how best we can make our continent great again. Yeah. Also, um, uh, I'm also a lawyer, uh, practicing in Kenya. I have quite a big interest in Africa as well, on especially matters trade, matters business. And today, we are discussing on the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement to just put into perspective the whole discussion, like uh, on the summary of what it is, what are the goals of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area and Agreement, and then some of the challenges that are likely to face the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. So, Chido, like especially on the goal of the Africa Continental Free Trade area. So looks like it's quite an ambitious project that Africa is trying to pursue. I mean, not ambitious in the sense that it can be achieved, but in the sense that it's trying to unite and get a free trade area across 54 African countries. So that seems like quite a huge task and also like a big goal to achieve. What do you think about it? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. So the African Continental Free Trade Area, as we've rightfully said, it is trying to bring together all African Union member states mm -hmm. so that they come up to become a single market of more than 1.2 billion people and a combined GT GDP of uh, 3.4 trillion. Mm -hmm. Right. So to date, we have got 54, 54 countries that have already signed the agreement and most of them are all going through the ratification process. The only country that hasn't signed the agreement as we speak is Eritrea. Mm -hmm. Looking at the, uh, the African continent of free trade area, it is actually believed to be the biggest trading bloc after the World Trade Organization. So it's actually a very big initiative that the African Union member states have decided to, to put in place. The GDP of Africa, mm -hmm. if it's combined, it's actually more or less along the size of the Indian GDP. So it's actually very big. Mm -hmm. But the broad objective is just not to combine resources and people, but it is to create a single continental market for mm -hmm. goods and services mm -hmm. that has got free movement of business, persons, and investments. It is the step towards achieving the big objective, which is to establish a continental customs union. That is a customs union that is specifically for Africa, within Africa, with Africa. I think. If this is achieved, as you're saying, as you're speaking about it, if this is achieved, especially if there's going to be more increase in trade across Africa and movement of people, that's going to really uplift the economies and the trade volumes within Africa. And especially when you get to the point of a customs union where you're having the same tariffs against other countries that are not in the continent. That really helps also to build up uh, each country and to have like a common voice on most of the things when you're negotiating for, you know, like uh, the goods that you're going to export to the international market, which sounds like it's quite, first, it's going to be a big step for Africa, but then I think it will be such a good step in the right direction. And as regards this agenda, like uh, the Africa continental free trade area, like Sounds like most African countries are really keen about this and pushing forward the agenda. What do you think about that? Well, uh, I think 
this is something that most African countries are actually so interested in. Mm-hmm. I would think that it's because, well, most of the countries are members to the World Trade Organization and they've actually seen what multilateralism has managed to do for other countries. Mm-hmm. Number one. Number two, uh, if you look at most people who are talking about it, they are mirroring it to the European Union or the European Customs Union. Mm-hmm. So basically, they have looked at the successes that have been registered within the EU, and they think it's something that can be imported to Africa. If you look right now with what's happening within the multilateral trading system, you realize that there are frictions, particularly amongst developing and develop, developed countries. Mm-hmm. Developing countries, of which African countries form most of the developing countries within the World Trade Organization, they're actually feeling that their concerns are not being heard. For instance, I'll try to give you an example of the the protocol on e-commerce within the uh, the World Trade Organization. There are actually issues around whether they should ne- they should launch negotiations for the protocol on e-commerce or they should rather first finish dealing with the Doha rounds of negotiations. Mm-hmm. And the developing countries of part- Africa, to be particular, is mainly interested in the Doha rounds of negotiations. So I'm thinking the reason why then you realize that most African countries are actually pushing for an African agenda or for an African continental of free trade area is because they are looking at it as a platform for Africans where they can come and have their concerns be heard and actually have something be done about whatever that will be going on. So you, like you said earlier, that it gives Africa an opportunity to actually harmonize the trade rules, to harmonize everything that, could, that pertains to trade. So that even when they go to the multilateral trading system, they are they're going there as a united front with one. So it's actually a good initiative for African countries. Yeah. And they are looking at it as a way to open up markets for each other and ensure that there is seamless trade and investment within the region, which is very, very good when you try to look at how that can boost trade performance and economic development in most African countries. Yeah, and I, I think a few things that most African countries would be concerned about is even when the like while in the in the World Trade Organization like the measures and the rules that affect like what's the quality of products that can be exported to each to different mm-hmm. countries, what's the phytosanitary measures that should be taken under which countries should comply. You find like most times mm-hmm. African countries most times will not meet the standards. And in any case, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes the products that they're exporting this they face such stiff competition or sometimes the quotas that they get to export to other places may not be as high as the African countries would, would want to. And so I think if mm-hmm. there is greater export amongst African countries, the, the rules should be a bit more lenient to each other. Mm-hmm. And also mm-hmm. in the sense that the rules can be made to accommodate what Africa is producing. So that now, yeah. if like for instance, it's fish that's being imported from South Africa into Uganda, the rules n- need not be as stiff as South Africa exporting fish to Germany, for instance. So I think yeah. uh, there's an advantage of even like having a market that prefers and tries to push for more African products being consumed within Africa. And also, about what you said about the European Union, I think there's at least there's, there are people who have gone ahead, and there are lessons that Africa can can learn from these people and these uh, regional economic communities to be able to come up with something that's effective for Africa. Even if I think Africa in itself needs to come up with a solution that is fit for Africa, you know, like build uh, rules mm-hmm. that fit Africa, build with an understanding of where Africa is at and what Africa needs, yeah. Yes, uh, you are right about that because I was I was looking at the text of the African continent of free trade area, mm-hmm. and you'd realize that when they talk about tariff concessions, it's a matter that is very delicate for most African countries, mainly because countries that are in Africa they generate revenue from tariff mm-hmm. revenue tariffs that they get at border port customs um, taxes and everything. It's an important generator for revenue, especially in least developed countries. In Africa, I'll give an example of Zimbabwe. So looking at the variables, what happened was during the negotiation, they had to come up with a plan that was specifically meant for Africa, that would that was tailor-made to suit the, the situation that is in Africa. So you realize that the G6 countries that are 
pretty much the least developed countries in Africa. You talk of your if you talk of your Zimbabwe, you've got Malawi, you've got Zambia, Sudan, Madagascar. They managed to secure a 15 year phase period mm-hmm. to phase out uh, the tariffs, which is complete, which is a completely different phase when you try to look at the developing countries like South Africa and, and, and Nigeria. So ultimately, it was very important and it is still important that we come up with the framework, as you have said before, that is for Africa. In as much as we can look at the European Union, how they have managed to be successful over the years, we still cannot just take the model from the European Union and impose it on Africa because ultimately the challenges that are faced within the EU are so different from the challenges that are faced within the African continent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very true. And and even something like tariff administration, you know, like uh, to be, if you look like on the even cost of having like a digital customs administration for a country yeah. that is not as much developed in Africa or that does not have the digital technology to be able to have a fully digitalized customs administration as goods are coming in and going out, even to determine the rules of origin and such things. It's almost like the rules for Africa needs needs to be so simple as simple but effective. Simple to cater for the person who is unable to deal with complicated rules of origin and the person who is trying to balance up not having a digital platform that they are able to clear the goods uh, that are coming into them without duty and such things. And also at the same time, balancing it off with the other countries that are able to maintain such a system so that the countries that are able can help pull up these other countries and not leave them behind. So I think, as you say, mm-hmm. like the situation of the European Union is quite different, so significantly different from Africa. In fact, when you think about it, like one of the reasons that it's, it has been pointed out, like the European Union is able to like even effectively tax the digital economy. They have something like the one point, uh, the mini one-stop shop for where anyone who is mm-hmm. trading within uh, the European Union and they want to register for VAT on digital services, they have one mini stop uh, shop where they can mm-hmm. register for VAT for the entire of EU. So what that means is that, for instance, mm-hmm. Facebook, it doesn't have to register in each European country. It can that's within the European Union, you can register in one at one point and then trade in whichever country. Mm-hmm. And then this one-stop uh, registration is able to track where you're generating revenues from and they're able to compute it and send it to that country. So that makes it so much easier wow. than splitting up like Uganda is trying to, to tax Facebook. South Africa is trying to run after Twitter. Uh, Kenya is trying to run after TikTok. And then everyone, it's almost like you're running after these things and there's really no help that you can have on each other. And like one of the things that has been pointed out on what Africa is trying to do, especially tax like the big MNEs in the digital economy and that's failing is because none of these digital MNEs are registered in Africa or if they're registered, I think South Africa is where like Facebook has, like in South Africa, most of the digital MNEs have their companies at. But for mm-hmm. most of these other African countries, you'll not find a Facebook office in Tanzania or a Facebook office in Eritrea or Djibouti. Yet Facebook is being used there or even Ethiopia. So what's happening is that the tax and administration in Ethiopia is trying to run after Facebook. They can't enforce against them. Yet there's a Facebook office in South Africa where South Africa can help enforce against Facebook. But without such collaboration mm-hmm. amongst African countries, one is left, you know, like trying to figure out what do I do even to get myself the little tax that I can collect. Well, there's another African country that can help you. So I think it's quite the rule is to just understand what really, where Africa is at, each individual country. You, you know, what you're saying is very important. I, I like the example that you gave about digital texting. I think one thing that we actually pick from all this is before we even talk about the other social or political challenges that the continent face that it actually has to deal with before the full implementation of the African continental or free trade area, we also need to look at issues that deal with the interoperability of the laws that actually exist within different countries, right? Mm-hmm. Like you, you have said before that it's so there is no seamless um Taxation, digital taxation within Africa. Each country is trying to do what is what whatever that it can at, at this particular moment, mm-hmm. and there is no communication. Mm-hmm. So I think the first thing that has to do is laws have to be harmonized. Mm-hmm. 
in as much as we've got a continental framework, it mm-hmm. cannot work if the domestic laws are not aligned to yeah. try and work together with the continental framework. Mm-hmm. The other challenge that we have in Africa has to do with the numerous regional economic communities that we have. We've got ECOWAS, mm-hmm. EAC, Comesa, SADAC, SACO, and all these other. They have their own set of rules of origins that they are used to complying with. They've got their own tariff concessions and schedules of concessions when it comes to the protocol or in in trade and services, right? So in as much as we have a, a provision that is Article 19 that speaks of the relationship between regional economic communities and the overall consent of free trade area agreement, I still feel that the laws and regulations that regulate the day-to-day trading aspects within the continent, they have to be harmonized. And another thing, Afri- the African continent of free trade area has to be in such a way that it actually benefits the people that actually participate in trade within the continent. So the problem that we have in every situation is we have got the leaders of government, right? We've got our trade ministers and police analysts going out, signing agreements Mm -hmm. that are just drafted, but without actually trying to tailor them in a way that actually suits the 99% persons that actually benefit or are taking part in the trading uh, in the trading system. Yeah. When we're speaking of Africa, the 99% that we're talking about is made of mm-hmm. MSMEs, mm-hmm. micro, small to medium enterprises. Mm-hmm. Those are the people that are affected by the trade rules and policies. Those are the people that actually engage in trade. Mm-hmm. And most of them are cross-border traders in Africa. And mm-hmm. more in more times, they are not even aware that there is an agreement that has been signed. Mm -hmm. They are not aware of the rules of origin. They Mm -hmm. don't even know what the the tariffs are at that particular moment. They are not aware of what's actually happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. So before we even celebrate that we've got an agreement, before we celebrate that we're trying to have a single market, we need to actually make sure that information gets to the people that are supposed to be benefiting from the agreement that we're talking about before we can talk of its full implementation and its successes. Yeah. And I, I like what you say because if you look at uh, like the small businessmen who is the majority in most African countries, I mean, the informal sector within Africa is quite big. Like you'll just find you say that the micro, the medium, the small enterprises are mm-hmm. trying to uh, survive in each of the African economies. And I don't think there is as much information even on the Africa continental free trade area that's being given to these businesses, like that they are aware, like there's this advantage that you can take up and these are the rules, uh, like the rules of origin that you need to comply with and then you can also export to these countries. I think there's quite a long way to go for this uh, marketing to be done and for people to actually adopt into it. Let's also speak about like some of the real challenges that Africa itself faces. Like, for instance, like, social, political issues that although there's the economic issue, there's also uh, like a businessman who wants to go and open up uh, their small business in, let's say, for instance, Malawi. And uh, this is a businessman Mm -hmm. coming from Sudan. And so leave Mm -hmm. alone the fact that they don't have the information that they can go open up there. But then our cultural, religious uh, differences, uh, the immigration restrictions and the political instabilities in some of these countries just literally put off any investor that would want to go set up shop there. So if like a country is so politically unstable, it's difficult to even attract someone who wants to go take the risk that their business will be shut down and go set up. Although like the political and the instability issues that face Africa face many countries, but in Africa it's particularly a thing that happens, especially in election years, there is just going to be, you're not too sure if you should go set up shop in some African country as an investor, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, before I even respond to that, I just needed to give you a practical example mm-hmm. when about what I meant about cross-border traders and SMEs not having any know-how on what's happening around them. I come from Zimbabwe, and because of how our economy is set up, I will tell you that 75%, if not more than that, 
are involved in the informal sector and they are engaging in one way of trade or the other. Mm-hmm. My mother, mm-hmm. she's a primary school teacher, but she's also a cross-border trader. And if I'm to have a conversation with her right now on the African continent of free trade area, I promise you she does not know anything, mm-hmm. regardless of the fact that she is well-read, she's a teacher, and she, she gets into these other intellectual conversations with other teachers and other people within the society. Mm-hmm. So that's how bad the lack of information is. So imagine if a person who's actually going to work, who is who has got access to the information, is not aware of the information. What more of those other people within the informal sector that do not have access to the same information that we're talking about? Yeah. So there is more that actually has to be done to ensure that information reaches the people. They know what we're talking about. And they see the benefits that they are supposed to be deriving from the African continent of free trade area. So that at the end of the day, it does not just come out as a document and over ambitious uh, plan by the African Union member states to integrate a market, but without uh, the practical aspect to it. And going back to the challenges that you said that are facing the continent, the social political challenges, I was reading this other report by the World Bank which actually says that most of the countries in Africa, they are classified as uh, FCV countries. That that These are countries that are riddled with fragility, conflict, and violence. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it's so difficult to attract investors in a country that is either fragile, that is conflict-infested, or that has got so much violence that's going on. Mm -hmm. From a perspective of an investor, right? Mm -hmm. I will tell you, as an investment practitioner, I would never advise my client to invest in a country where the economy is not stable enough, where the, the laws are not as, that they are not easily accessible and certain, where there is a lot of political tension, because ultimately it is inimical to investment. Speaking of investment laws, in most countries right now, their laws on expropriation and nationalization mm. are not even very clear. So we can't then talk of investments when we when a person risks having to have their property expropriated by the government or taken as part of the nationalization project. This has been made very glaring, especially due to COVID-19 in 2020. Mm-hmm. Most countries, not only in Africa, decided to nationalize most of other businesses because they were trying to come up with uh, businesses that uh, hospitals, and all these other things. There were hotels that were expropriated, right, by Mm -hmm. the government Mm -hmm. that were nationalized so that hospitals can be, they can be constructed Mm -hmm. to to, to meet the demand. Mm -hmm. In as much as it was something that happened during a pandemic, but that then speaks to the legal framework within most African countries, that Mm -hmm. it is questionable. So up until we, we, we start dealing with investor protection, we start dealing with the issues that are inherent to the continent, I think it will become difficult for us to even talk of investment. Yeah. And without investment, it is very difficult for us to talk, to talk of a single market within the continent. Mm. And I think there's a point at which a document, the Africa continental free trade area needs to stop being an, a document and for it mm-hmm. for, actually, for people to actually trade. So that it's a good thing that we have a document, but the people who are on the ground who are the investors, who is the small-scale farmer, who is the fisherman, they need to be the ones trading. They need to be the ones, uh, the fisherman in Lake Victoria on the Kenya side should be the one looking at how he's going to start trading with Tanzania and to start exporting into Tanzania. Like, to actually Mm -hmm. realize these benefits, it has to be, you know, like the business person who is, with at the border, let's even the smallest thing like at the border between Kenya and Ethiopia to just start looking for ways of just like going across border and, and trying to trade in that case. But then I also would like to comment, especially when you're speaking about like our laws, but I think the other thing to clearly uh, speak about is the judicial systems in African countries. Yeah. So the other yeah. day, I, I, I was having a discussion, especially on Kenya, because like the Kenya judiciary, there has been fights. There's tension, especially between the executive and the judiciary. And recently, there has been a proposal that there should be almost like an, an oversight, someone who is overseeing the functions of the judiciary from the executive. And my argument was that 
These are three arms of the government that there should be separation of power because the minute that the executive decides to start supervising the judiciary, that's where the problem, why would an investor, if let's say for instance an investor comes to Kenya and they want to have the comfort that if for instance the Kenya Revenue Authority taxes me more than they should tax me, I should be able to go to the courts and the courts will decide for me. The minute that the Kenya Revenue Authority who is uh, part of the executive, uh, who is a state organ, decides to be supervising the judiciary, at what point does an investor then feel comfortable knowing that I can invest yeah. and my income will not be unfairly taxed or that I will not lose my revenue because of bad implementation of otherwise good tax laws? So I think the problem yeah. is that there might even be good laws, but if the judiciaries in these countries are are not empowered, that they are not uh, independent of themselves to be able to uphold some of these laws, if it's the executive that's always going to be saying that the judiciary can't do this, or if it's the parliament that's going to be always firing the chief justice in a country, then that really interferes with even upholding the very system of investment that you want investors to be comfortable with. And I think... There is a point at which this document that we have, which might be good on the Africa Continental Free Trade Ag- Agreement, that might be good, but we are killing it. You know, like the systems yeah. in these countries are killing it. Like it may just never happen because countries are not thinking about how the small decision of firing the chief justice can impact the outcome of the Africa Continental Free Trade area, you know. You know, raise a very important point mm-hmm. about the judiciary system within Africa. And it's so mm-hmm. sad to note that it's not a Kenyan problem. Mm-hmm. It's an African problem. In most African countries, I would say three quarters or even almost the whole continent, there is a problem with executive interference of judicial decisions, yeah. especially in instances where the executive has got a stick in the game, right? Mm-hmm. So I'll, we will go back to investor confidence. In as much as we can say the laws are there and they are good, laws are n- cannot be assessed on paper. Mm-hmm. It's how they are implemented and it's how they are interpreted by the courts. Mm-hmm. So if the courts cannot interpret the laws that are already existing within any republic in a manner that actually protects the citizens, then they cease to be laws that are, are available in that republic. Yeah. I would want to cite, um, maybe moving away from, from the judiciary system, I would want to cite the example of what has been happening in Nigeria in the, in the past week, past week and a few days or so. My heart goes out to the Nigerians that lost their lives in whatever that was going on. But Nigeria is known to be the hub of oil, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. We know that Nigeria has got oil deposits. Mm-hmm. And when the make no mistake, when we're talking about investment in Africa, we're not even talking about Western in, investment. Mm-hmm. Investment in Africa by fellow Africans, mm-hmm. myself, would not feel comfortable investing in Nigeria right now with the tension that's going on. Mm-hmm. I would not feel comfortable with investing in Mali with what's going on right now. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with me being African and trying to be patriotic and trying to, to, to move on with Afrontism and everything. This has everything to do with me being a business person mm. because ultimately the goal for an investor to engage in investment or start an investment in any place is to generate profit. Mm-hmm. So if I see that the environment threatens mm-hmm. the ultimate goal for myself, which is to generate profit, it's inconceivable. It does not make sense. It's unsustainable for me to then decide to invest in. So most African countries, they have got raw materials, right? We are pretty much a continent that is rich in raw materials. Mm -hmm. And if we had been a stable continent, politically, socially, it was going to be very easy for us to actually implement the African continental free trade area and reap the benefits. Mm -hmm. The problem is, we can't compare Western investors with African investors mm-hmm. because some of these Western investments, they actually is conflict and chaos. I read a report that was talking about how in DRC and in Somalia, there were a lot of uh, illicit financial flows mm-hmm. from the continent getting out of the continent mm-hmm. through blood diamonds and everything. 
thing, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. There is conflict, but ultimately there's somebody who's benefiting from the conflict. But I don't think I can say the same for an African investor. Mm-hmm. So they are African investors because most of them are still growing. They are mm-hmm. startups. They actually need an environment that is stable enough to nature the investments, ensure that they grow and produce an output. Yeah. And and I think uh, this is such good uh, points, especially when you say about Nigeria, because you see Nigeria is like they are fighting for against police brutality and, and SARS. And the Nigerian government, I doubt they think even how this is affecting Africa and an African investor when when there's such uh, situations going on, I think there's a certain level which African countries are too self-absorbed. Like you're, you're not thinking mm-hmm. greater than outside your borders. So, and mm-hmm. and thing is that at, I think it, it, it needs to go to the point where you're saying that I'm not doing this because I'm an African. I'm doing this because I'm mm-hmm. a businessman. I'm doing this because yeah. I'm looking to grow my business or to expand or to offer services. Like, I would not do this at any cost, you know, and especially when the cost is that mm-hmm. you're causing an otherwise uh, proper, you know, place to be to get into such chaos, you know. And yeah. the African government, yeah. I think, one of the things that they need to truly like think about, even at the Africa yeah. Union level, is to literally just look at themselves in how they are governing these countries. And it's not just the economic, yeah. also what you say, we now have a very good investment law. No, it goes down mm-hmm. to the president being questioned on uh, what is this conflict about po- police brutality in the country? What is this with judicial mm-hmm. interference that you're having? Because these are the things that are going to affect mm-hmm. the implementation of the Africa continental free trade area. And I think until, I think there is such a almost sober conversation and uh, actually highlight what the problems are, then I think it's just going to be a good document that we have, but that just never produces the results that it would otherwise produce. You know, you know when, when this, the plan was initially like launched and it, it was going through stages and, and stages up until we got to a point where the agreement had been ratified and it was just about to be implemented. Mm-hmm. The situation was different mm-hmm. as different to where we are today. Mm-hmm. What am I talking about? I'm basically saying the dynamics have shifted because of COVID-19, right? Mm-hmm. In as much as nobody wants to talk about it, it has really affected mm-hmm. the implementation of the African continental free trade area. Mm-hmm. And the effect have nothing whatsoever to do with the delay. Yes, it was supposed to have been launched this year and it has been postponed, so to say, to January 2021. But that's not the only way that COVID-19 has actually affected the African continent of free trade area. Mm-hmm. Countries negotiated trade rules that they thought they wanted to abide with, right? Mm-hmm. So they were not supposed to wait for the implementation, the full implementation of the African continent of free trade area to actually start putting those things into practice, mm-hmm. right? We are trying to create a liberalized market for Africa. Mm-hmm. But during the lockdown and all the chaos that was going around because of COVID, we noticed very protectionist countries. Mm -hmm. Some countries, especially the least developing countries, because they don't have industries for PPEs and food and everything that was essential during COVID-19, right? Mm -hmm. They had to relax their border restrictions, open up their borders so that they can attract imports from other countries that actually have the resources. But the the so-called superpowers within the continent, Mm -hmm. they were actually putting in the export restrictions on PPEs, food, and all these other essential goods, mm-hmm. which basically goes against the latent spirit of the African continent of free trade area. Yeah. How can we have a single market for Africans when we've got other countries that are now inward looking and putting in place protectionist measures? Mm-hmm. Most countries right now, because there is post COVID economic recovery, they are looking inward first. So it's basically our citizens first and everybody else would follow, which basically, again, goes against the principles, the very, very fundamental principles of having a single market within the continent. Mm. I I am starting to think that most people get into a frenzy Mm -hmm. when they sign documents and negotiate and everything without actually thinking about the feasibility of that within their own countries. Mm. 
they get little then just get caught up by the wave, go negotiate and sign agreements, but without having an intention to implement to the letter those agreements that they actually sign. Because of how the global GDP shrinks because of COVID-19, it also means that the African GDP shrinks Mm -hmm. in the more serious way, which basically means that whatever that we think we were supposed to achieve with the African or we, we endeavor to achieve with the African continent of free trade, the threshold is twice as much now, mm-hmm. which basically means that if we were talking about liberalization, which was supposed to be done slowly, the need is more because we now have to deal with post, post-COVID economic recovery. And we cannot do that as islands. We need to then open our borders, actually put to practice what we signed for as a continent when we said we needed a single market in the first place. Mm. You know, when you're saying about African leaders go and sign a document, sometimes you wonder if they actually take seriously what they're signing. You know, it's like you just truly should take it seriously that if I'm going to sign on to this Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, then I, I should not sign it. Then the next day pass a law that restricts immigration. Yes. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. like it, it mm-hmm. just literally, it's almost like you act in the direct opposite direction of what you've committed yourself to. And so, no. yeah, I think there's that part. And, and we could go on and on. I mean, time has gone so fast because we are hoping to do this in 30 to 45 minutes. We just have a, like six minutes left. But I think, uh, one of the other, big thing that you brought up and I think is important to mention is especially on the economic disparities across uh, African countries. Like look at Burundi versus Seychelles, Comoros versus Mm -hmm. Mauritius. Look at, look at, you know, like there's such disparities and then you find, although there's, there's actually the economic protectionist tendencies that some countries have where they're closing up the borders and, and imposing greater uh, immigration restrictions. But then also, there's also the risk uh, that has been highlighted, which I think is a real risk, that especially countries that do not have such great production capacity, where the industries are really not producing even the basic uh, commodities within the country, they risk uh, Mm -hmm. the fact that an African country whose uh, industries are working and the production is working well to flood (coughs) the market with Mm -hmm. those goods, yeah? And then the end result is such that there is a country that is almost benefiting a lot from this agreement, and there's a mm-hmm. country whose mm-hmm. industries, uh, the local industries, are just are not being built as much. Because as much as we are saying that there will be free movement of people, it doesn't mean that now there's going to be an entire shift of the entire African economy yeah. to South Africa yeah. or to Nigeria yeah. or to yeah. Egypt. Yeah. Like there are people need yeah. the, the local industries of each African country need to have capacity and to be able to maintain the population in that country so that we don't want to have a situation where just because the borders have been opened, now everyone wants to go live in Tanzania, you know? Yes. It's just that yes. you need yeah, you need to have these countries also within themselves or just run away from all political instability, let's say, in Liberia and decide that now I'm moving to Ghana. I mean, so there yes. needs to be like even an understanding of like the domestic markets in each of the countries need to have a certain production capacity to maintain these populations within these countries. Otherwise, you run the risk of having super economic powers, but also an influx of set of population to a, to certain specific countries, leaving other countries even without the labor. You know. All that you have said, you know, how, you know how I would summarize it. I would say, let's work with comparative advantage, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. What do I mean by that? Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example of South Africa and Zimbabwe, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. South Africa, uh, for argument's sake, let's just say South Africa is well known for its wine industry. Mm-hmm. Zimbabwe is an agrarian economy, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of Zimbabwe trying to produce wine Mm -hmm. why don't zimbabwe focus it has got agrarian land why don't it focus on farming Mm -hmm. maize tobacco Mm sugar cane right Mm -hmm. which can be processed in zimbabwe and then exported to the other countries Mm -hmm. that cannot farm maize tobacco and sugar cane Mm -hmm. in south africa instead of trying to also farm sugar cane Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. given that the weather conditions are not so conducive for it, why don't it focus on just wine production, which then can be exported to the rest of Africa? Mm-hmm. So what African, what most African countries need to do is they need to go sit down, go back to the drawing board, and actually look at what they have an advantage in comparison to other countries Mm -hmm. and focus their energy on making sure that they are the best at that. Mm -hmm. So if you are an if you are an oil exporting country, if you 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 focus on making sure that you mine oil, you collect it, it goes through processing and then it is exported to other countries. Mm -hmm. And then you import those commodities that are not within your country. Mm -hmm. That way we make sure that in every country there is something that is going on. Mm -hmm. But then we also need not to be um, blind to the fact that it seems as if most African countries sort of skip the industrialization process that other countries had to go through, mm-hmm. China, Europe, and, and, and America. Right? Mm-hmm. But the sad reality for Africa now is it can't go to the first, second, third revolution because we're already getting into the fourth industrial revolution. Mm-hmm. Some countries, as we speak right now, they need to focus on ensuring that they have got viable industries, processing industries, manufacturing industries, for whatever they've got a comparative advantage to within that particular country. I was thinking about it, that most African countries don't have proper roads, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which basically makes it so difficult to transport raw materials and goods from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to this other interview by Elon Musk, Mm -hmm. and he was talking about his vision uh, to put tunnels 3D roads whereby they are put tunnels underneath every city. It's basically meant to alleviate the tension that is on the roads and uh, the congestion and everything, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got countries that are thinking of putting 3D tunnels Mm -hmm. that are underneath cities and we've got other countries in Africa that actually don't have proper gravel Mm roads. You see how out it is. And when we are saying Africa is trading, we are basically not saying Africa is turning out the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. They would still need to catch up with globalization and trade within themselves and also with other countries. Mm -hmm. So there is so much that actually has to be done right now. And it's not something that can be done by a single country. It's something that can be done collectively as a country. So the first step is let's focus on what we've got a comparative advantage. Let's develop our industries to a point where they match the need right now and also to a point where we can say we are also trying to adapt to the disruptive technologies that everybody is talking about Mm -hmm. and then when we do that we can we cannot just come up with industries with no legal frameworks and and policies to bake them up we also do deal with that we then have our laws harmonized and i think if, if we manage to do that we can be in a position to actually start saying you know what this document is working Mm. Okay, and and I think some something to say that's common in most African countries. You find that the struggles are quite the same. Food security, yeah. each country is trying to mm-hmm. work towards food security, healthcare for its citizens, infrastructure. What you say, each country is trying to figure out how to to, to upgrade their roads, uh, their railway transport, their airports. So you find that each of uh, African countries there are some common things, especially when you say like, how about like Zim focuses on producing food. There's need for food security in most African countries. There's no food security mm-hmm. people like the government. One of the maybe campaign agendas for each election year is food security is top on the list, you know. And then there's even infrastructure and governments are really trying to figure this thing out, just as you're suggesting. So I think there's even with the comparative advantage, that will work really good, what you're saying. And especially also knowing that there are things that are common pain points for all African countries and to try and solve them collectively. It could start there by all, all of you looking and saying, yeah, we are all trying to achieve food security and then trying to work backwards towards who can produce food, who can do this, who can export to us. And I think... There's so much that can be done uh, to make this happen, but I think there is there is a lot that needs to be thought through and how this fits into yeah. the Africa countries and how this will even fit into maintaining the same level of exports that are going to the international market. Just as you're saying, it doesn't mean yeah. that now Ghana cannot export cocoa to the international market. Yeah. We should be able to export cocoa yeah. to the international market and be able to export coffee to the international market. 
as you serve the African yeah. continent. So yeah. it's going to be quite a lot. So if you could conclude this for us, and then uh, we will do this uh, next time. Uh, I'm I'm sad that we we are just about to to end this session. But I think the takeaway is okay. It's it's so difficult to start talking about how the grassroots um, cross border trader has to fit in within the framework without talking about access to finance, right? Mm-hmm. So this is also an issue that African government has to have to really consider. You would realize that, like I was saying, most of these other SMEs are not aware of what's happening. We've got the African Bank saying that they've got a $3 billion financial facility for SMEs in Africa. The African Development Bank rolling out a $1 billion, $1 billion facility. But the very same SMSC trader who's supposed to be benefiting from that is not aware of that, the fact that there are institutions that are actually uh, uh, giving out money so that SMEs boost their, their, their businesses and they've got access to capital. I actually wrote a paper on MSMEs and COVID-19 developing countries, and it was looking at how COVID-19 has actually led to the closure of most MSME businesses within developing countries, particularly within the African continent, right? And those are basically the people that we were looking at or looking up to as being the initiators of post-COVID economic recovery and also the beneficiaries of the African continent of free trade area. So I think the takeaway now is there is a lot that governments have to do to ensure that business is resuscitated for MSMEs because they constitute the majority of traders within the continent. There is also, there is supposed to be inclusion of those other groups that are historically marginalized. We're talking about the youth, we're talking about women. Especially when you look at the involvement of, of the youth in this whole framework. I think we should draw lessons from the Brexit and what's happening in the European Union. It is actually cited as one of the reasons why Britain decided to exit the, the European Union. The fact that it was not inclusive of the youth within the Euro, within the Eurozone. Right. Mm-hmm. So it has to ultimately be um, an integration that not only works for the leaders, but works for the very same person in Africa, the, the very same Africa. It's supposed to be an integration that works for the person who is in the rural areas as much as it works for the person who owns a multi-million dollar uh, business within the continent. And if we manage to address these issues, I think there is so much light, there is so much hope, there is light at the end of the tunnel to make sure that this is actually a success. And I think we also need to be mindful of external influence. The idea of an African continent of free trade area is scary because a a united Africa, nobody knows what it can do. I think the opportunities and they are just they they are just limitless. Mm -hmm. So they will always probably try to be opposition from this side and that side. But ultimately, we have to remain a united front to ensure that the vision 2063 is achieved. Okay. Chido, thanks, thanks a lot for like those really uh, good points and everyone who is listening in. We will pick up some of these discussions and try to wrap up on them, even on things like uh, United Africa. Is it something to be feared? Is it something what would Africa need to look at uh, to ensure that it addresses itself and prepares itself for such maybe that party influence within Africa? But thanks for listening in. We will be back next week discussing something uh, more about Africa. Goodbye for today.